Okay, the time now is 12.30 and it's time for Traffic Corner Tuesday. Hello everyone and welcome to Traffic Corner Tuesday. My name is Nancy Crow, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing for SPAC Consulting and your host for today's session. Hello everyone, can you hear me now? This is Nancy Crow, and I am the Vice President of Marketing for SPAC Consulting and your host for today's session. Hello everyone and welcome to Traffic Corner Tuesday. My name is Nancy Crow and I'm the Vice President of Marketing for SPAC Consulting and your host for today's session. Hi all, Mike's back here. Uh, we're trying to get started with Nancy Crow trying to join us remotely. Uh, can you let everyone know, can everyone let us know if you're hearing me or Nancy Crow? Is Mike's back here. This is Nancy Crow. Hello, can you hear me? I was able to hear both Mike and Bryant. Audio is working. All right, Mike, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Okay, let's make, make this, okay. let's make this roll. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Traffic Corner Tuesday. My name is Nancy Crow, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing for SPAC Consulting, your host for today's session. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone of a couple housekeeping details. Uh, please mute your mics. Uh, mute your mics to minimize some of the background noise during the session. And also, I would encourage you to please join the conversation. Today's presentation is intended to be an interactive dialogue. We would encourage you and all of the attendees to feel free to ask questions or share your experiences throughout the presentation. You do not need to wait till the end of the presentation. Just simply use the chat function on your screen to share with us your question or idea and we would be happy to share it with the rest of the attendees today. Also, I want to uh, thank everyone before I introduce our speakers and, and uh, share with you that we greatly appreciate your support. We started this experiment in October and have had a number of Traffic Corner Tuesdays and have had a lot of positive feedback about these sessions. And with each new session, we've seen a growing number of participants. Uh, if you find this presentation interesting, I would encourage you to explore our blog, Mike on Traffic, 
We publish new transportation-related articles each week featuring case studies, how-to articles, and industry news. And also take a moment to visit SPAC Academy. Our presenters today, Mike Spack and Brian Feastick, have created a variety of traffic engineering tools designed to improve your productivity and your bottom line. And finally, I'd like to just take a moment to introduce today's presenters. Mike Spack is the president of Spack Consulting and is the recognized industry leader of traffic studies. He is a graduate of the University of Minnesota, past president of North Central Section of the Institute of Transportation Engineers and a fellow of the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Since 1996, Mike has led over a thousand traffic engineering projects, and during the past two decades, Mike has founded four companies, including SPAC Consulting, and is the creative force and principal writer of the industry-leading blog, Mike on Traffic. He's an accomplished author with articles published in industry publications, as well as several industry manuals that are used by engineers around the world. Please welcome Mike SPAC. Also joining us today is Bryant Fiesick. He is the Vice President of SPAC Consulting. He is also widely known in the transportation industry, having managed more than 700 traffic engineering projects. He is also a graduate of the United, uh, University of Minnesota. Bryant is an expert in Synchro, Sim Traffic, Vistro, and vSim traffic modeling software packages, and thrives on developing creative solutions for traffic and transportation issues. Bryant is a regular contributor on Mike on Traffic, and a published author in the industry publications as well as co-author of several industry manuals with Mike. Please join me in welcoming Brian Fiesick. Hi all, thanks for joining Brian and myself. So Mike here, and uh, as Nancy said, uh, we're part of SPAC Enterprise and most of you uh, know who we are. There's just a little bit about the different uh, companies and endeavors we have going on. Today, we're going to give a, a quick update on the Highway Capacity Manual, the sixth edition that just came out. We got our physical copy <laughs> mailed to us uh, about a week and a half ago, and uh, we're happy to go through those updates with you. Uh, next week, based on a, a request coming out of our, our last series of these webinars, uh, we're going to be presenting on when you should put in permanent versus temporary traffic control at recurring events. Okay, thanks for that note on the feedback. We'll turn off the, the phone to make sure that's off. Um, so from there, uh, then we'll be back in January with a couple more presentations. So today, uh, we'll be talking about the differences between the Highway Capacity Manual 2010 and the uh, new Highway Capacity Manual 6th edition. And a big tip off here is uh, we're going from HCM 2010 to HCM 6. Uh, HCM 2010 was uh, a very substantial uh, redoing of, of the Highway Capacity Manual. They broke it up into four different modules uh, with the fourth volume being an online living document. Uh, I would characterize the 6th edition more as a tweak, not a complete overhaul, and I think them going back to <laughs> calling it the sixth edition uh, instead of HCM 2016 is a tip-off to that. So uh, I'm going to go through nine changes uh, that I think are significant, that Bryant and I both think are significant uh, updates, uh, and we're actually for those of you who may be short on time, uh, we're going to start with the most important ones first and, uh, and uh, <laughs> then get to ones that we feel are worth letting you know about, but ones that probably won't come up in your day-to-day -day work. Uh, so the first change uh, I very much feel <laughs> is the biggest change uh, is related to roundabouts. Uh, based on a lot of current research, uh, they have found through uh, different NCHRP reports and publications that roundabouts now have 25 to 30 percent more capacity than was originally thought when they were doing the HCM 2010. Yeah, and this matches with our experience as we've been doing studies and have been observing traffic and then trying to um, 
calibrate our models as we look at this, we've noticed that uh, generally people are just getting better at driving. There's more of them around. People are more familiar with them. You don't see the people stop in the middle and have no idea what to do for two or three minutes anymore. Everybody is seeming to get more comfortable with it, so that capacity goes up. So it's it's meeting with at least our observations, and I'm sure many of you working on this too have noticed that as well. So 25% more capacity compared to what? Uh, to illustrate that, it, the sample problem from HCM 2010, uh, if you plugged in the volumes and the lane configurations, the geometry for the roundabouts, you would have ended up with an overall level of service E uh, for that overall intersection in that first example problem. With those same exact inputs, uh, now using the HCM 6 with the factors, the adjustments for capacity in, in the HCM 6, you will end up with level of service C. Nothing has changed but the adjustments for the capacity. Yeah, it's a, it comes with the headways and follow-up times. They've adjusted that. It's basically people are getting more comfortable traveling closer together. They don't need as big a gap in order to enter the roundabout. They're, they're uh, using the yield more correctly, so we're just fitting a lot more vehicles through the intersection compared to our original formulas. So uh, we checked both Vistro and Synchro this morning, and we did not see any updates. No, both are pending, and that would be for not only roundabouts, but all their formulas just to make the software um, compatible with HCM6. Um, I'm sure they're both coming. I would expect both of them to have updates and other software as well to have updates within the next month. But one thing we've done now that the HCM6 is published and we consider it now the default document is we've gone in and it's easy in both Vistro and Synchro to change uh, those couple of factors because um, the algorithms are the same. It's just the input for one of the variables. So we've changed those variables to match the HCM6. So we are now doing HCM6 compliant roundabout calculations, even though the default software is not there yet. So would this increase in capacity still be accurate for areas where there are no roundabouts yet? Great question. <laughs> and <laughs> do you have a thought, thought on that, Brian? Yeah, I think that's going to, um, it's really going to depend on the engineer. We get back to that engineering judgment. Um, is it truly new to an area? Is this an isolated community where most people aren't traveling to a nearby metro where there's a bunch or something like that? Um, so I think it's a judgment call as to whether you think the uh, capacity increase will be there. The other thought I have on that is it will get better over time, so your first six months to a year, you may have less capacity, but then if, if you're doing your analysis um, down in the future, five years, 20 years into the future, you will see that increase in capacity. So uh, you should also keep in mind when your, your year is. All right, another question about the list of variables that change when compared to the 2010 version. Uh, it's mainly the headway and the follow-up times. Um, I don't have them off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't either. Um, so we can certainly blast that out in an email after the fact. We can let you know what variables have changed for the roundabout so you can then go in to your software and make the changes right now if you want. Okay. So the next change coming uh, that we think is a, is a big one as well um, is related to uh, what we're calling alternative intersections. And if you don't know about these, please email me or Bryant. We actually have a, a research guide, um, tech brief, a couple of pages that describes these. But basically, they're ways of taking left turns out of the main intersection in each of these different ways and moving them either past the intersection or further down. Um, for instance, uh, at an R-cut intersection, which are becoming more mainstream, uh, basically off the side street, you have a right-in, right-out coming, 
but you come out right in, right out. But if you want to actually treat it as a through movement, you would be going make going further down to a dedicated left turn lane, making U turn and then coming down, or likewise continuing on for left turn. Um, and these types of intersections are becoming more popular. Uh, we're not sure how the software packages are going to handle this. Um, yeah, previously when we looked at these, we have calculated essentially three intersections. You might have your main one with the right in, right out, and then uh, assuming you're treating it the same on both sides, you'll have another intersection to each side. So then you not only have to compute the delays at each of those, but then the travel times in between, and that all gets added together for a comparison of if you just had a traditional intersection with full access. So, um, yeah, we're, we're interested to see how they yeah. incorporate that and, and how that mixes together. Yeah, I, I mean, this is probably, to me, the most exciting update in the whole HCM6 is recognizing these new types of intersections and giving us the tools to do apples to apples comparisons of these alternative intersections, the delays coming out of this versus the delays at signals versus the delays at roundabouts and stop signs so we can really do a comparable analysis uh, where we don't have to go through quite a bit of effort as Bryant described the handful of times we've analyzed these different alternative intersections in our studies. Uh, this adds several hours to the methodology <laughs> um, and is not straightforward to explain what we're doing inside the reports. Yeah, that's probably the hardest part is trying to explain that in a report. Here's what we did to make it the same. So that's change number two. Uh, change number three, uh, I would consider this the third most important. Right now, uh, we're in the HCM 2010 analysis, if we had a free right turn or yielding here or even an ad lane at a signal, we would subtract out the right turn vehicles and just not include those in the analysis, in the delay calculations, was how HCM 2010 did it. Now, uh, the HCM 6 is recognizing these right turns. So you put in the volume there and key in, code in the proper configuration for that free right turn. And if there's a little bit of delay because the main intersection is busy up here and you would get some queuing in that right turn lane, that is part of the overall calculations, plus it gives you the delay for that right turn movement. So that's another change. Um, these three are kind of the big ones for most of us nuts and bolts traffic engineers doing intersection analyses. And I believe this change also makes it more applicable to how they treat roundabouts. So yes. you have more of that apples to apples comparison now. You don't uh, previously the roundabout included the right turn calculation, but the signal didn't. Now they both include it. So uh, you really are getting those that true similar comparison when you're looking at different traffic control options. Okay. The next one, but we're starting to get into more edge cases in my opinion, is uh, an auxiliary through lane they have added. Uh, so this is basically add a lane on one side of the intersection for the through, but then we end up with a lane drop some point after, uh, and they've keyed in so you can put the distances on both sides of the intersection, and uh, obviously any of us <laughs> who've driven know that when you have a lane drop, you end up with less utilization in that through lane um, and also a weaving effect downstream too. So they're taking those things into consideration at the intersection delay. And this will be another one that will be interesting to see how, um, uh, in particular, synchro sim traffic, how they account for that. I'm, I'm sure most people here have plug that in and use just nodes at each end, which can affect your delays and other stuff. You have to toggle a lot of different factors to make this work currently. So now if we've got something that we can automatically put in, again, we'll see where the software goes with it and if it makes it easier on us to, to analyze this type of operation. So the fifth change uh, is diverging diamond interchanges. Uh, these have been around. Uh, for half a dozen years now, Missouri was really... A little more really, than that. Yeah, yeah Missouri was really... 
Zuri was really pioneer on these, but I think these are becoming more common. So basically, we're switching traffic over to drive on the wrong side of the road um, through the interchange and then come back after the intersection. Uh, in HCM 6 adds this when in the interchange analysis section, um, which isn't as commonplace as just doing normal, straightforward intersection analysis, but you should know that this is in here now so you can have an apples to apples comparison with the standard diamond uh, intersections and some of the cloverleaf configurations. Next one, which uh, I'm excited about, I'm curious to see how much this actually gets utilized, is they've added in a bunch of methodology for calculating level service and delays uh, through a work zone, a construction project. Uh, so the corridor analysis has been in HCM for quite a while, but now there are factors. Obviously, <laughs> we're doing road work in a zone that's going to decrease the capacity. Um, now this gives us a tool to better uh, come up with numbers of what the effects will be of the work zones um, and possibly looking at different ways of configuring the work zones or we can start to do kind of cost-benefit analysis on what the benefits will really be if we shrink that amount of time we're doing the construction in the work zones. Um, I think this has been a kind of a weakness in our industry is we could end up doing a road project that goes a couple years to add a little bit of capacity to a corridor, but the pain and agony and the, <laughs> the public goes through during construction isn't really accounted for, and we don't get a true before after kind of cost benefit. Is it worth doing that construction project? Yeah, we'll have to see if we can push some of our public agencies to start incorporating this, and uh, just like Mike said, see you see how that factors into the overall project. Okay. So number seven is they've added in managed lanes, so the diamond lanes, the high occupancy vehicle, the toll lanes. So this, there's methodology now for including these in your corridor analyses. So again, a nice tool. Uh, number eight, uh, there are speed and capacity adjustment factors for both the corridor analyses and uh, as well as the intersection analyses, and they've added in ways, variables, to account for weather or incidents. I imagine this will be very valuable in kind of the hurricane zones where you have evacuation plans um, to try to look at what's happening in, in heavy rain events coming out of somewhere in Florida or the Gulf Coast. Um, I'm not sure how much it matters up here in Minnesota when we get uh, a blizzard condition. <laughs> I guess we can model that, but we all know it just goes from bad to worse around here. All right. uh, and then uh, kind of wrap up the, the ninth uh, big change is related to the urban street section. There's a small tweak in the level service A calculation. This is the only change in the thresholds between level services. So. Nothing changed for intersections and the different control types, but here at urban street corridors, uh, they've gone from a threshold of 85% down to 80% uh, for level service A. So that what that means is uh, on a 50 mile an hour speed limit road, uh, before level service A was anything above 42 and a half miles per hour, now it is at 40 miles per hour and above. So this is a pretty minor change, and to me, not really an important one. Um, I certainly don't give much thought to anything uh, operating at level of service A or B. <laughs> it's when we're getting into the C, D, right. E ranges that that's uh, when our, our flags go up and we need to start addressing possible mitigation. So uh, with that, those are nine big changes. Uh, kind of just to recap, we think this is a, a tweak in the highway capacity manual. A couple of changes, uh, obviously roundabout capacity, adding the alternative intersections, and the right turn lane, uh, like Brian said, makes roundabouts versus signals more apples to apples. Uh, but this is definitely not a major overhaul and uh, not a major overhaul uh, any of the capacity analyses that we do, but for 
the roundabout capacity adjustments? Yeah, I think the really the major takeaway is uh, make sure to update your software. I mean, realistically, they're going to take all this information, they're going to incorporate it, and so it's nice to be aware of the changes. It's, it'll be better once we have those tools updated so we can uh, really start using all this information and incorporating it into the studies. So with that, uh, our next live traffic corner uh, is going to be next week. I uh, hope you'll join us. Uh, you'll certainly be getting emails and, and see things to sign up again for that. Uh, we will be covering uh, permanent versus temporary measures, uh, more for recurring events. So these are perhaps state fairs that go on for a while. Uh, churches on Sunday mornings we'll, we'll put into this category. Um, but these are different than uh, a couple weeks ago. We did a traffic corner on more of an annual event once or twice a year. Um, so this is more of the gray zone <laughs> of, of when you add in features. So thanks, everyone, and uh, hope to see you next week. Uh, feel free to... Oh, here we go. Uh, any more questions? What is your opinion about the new planning level analysis methods and associated guidebook? That was the topic of a recent ITE webinar. Um, they did add in, basically they added back in some of the planning level analysis. Um, it don't get, uh, so it's, not, it's putting in some preliminary numbers, but not quite going all of the way to the level of service calculations. Frankly, software is so easy to use now. Um, I can't imagine doing many back of the envelope calculations in a meeting, but I guess if you're going to do that, that's when that planning level uh, could be, that could come into play um, if you wanted to do some iterating on the spot. But we have found Bistro uh, to a slightly lesser degree synchro so easy to use that we just go straight to the full calculations now. Um, yeah, I, th I think the only time I could see using that is if you really truly have the wide spectrum of stuff to use. I mean, most often you, you're you choosing between a handful, two to three to four options. You know what those options are. And uh, like Mike said, with the software, uh, the way they're making it point and click, essentially, it's pretty easy just to analyze each of those options. So I guess if you're truly looking at a dozen different ways to do things, um, that might be the time you could go to that and try to narrow that down. Uh, but otherwise, you should be able to use the software for what you need. Okay. And uh, Tony uh, asked for copies of the slides. We can certainly turn this into a PDF and include that as a follow-up uh, to everyone. So we'll do that for everyone, Tony. So look for that in the next few days. Uh, Robert asked about weather, and doesn't that affect the addition of capacity ideal conditions? Uh, certainly does. <laughs> um, and Yes, when we're doing our analysis, we are very much assuming a normal, normalized weekday uh, for the vast majority of our analysis. Um, good weather, clear sight lines, clear lighting. Um, so this gets into the edge of that. And if you're going to be making those kinds of adjustments, definitely uh, flag that in your report. But I think the weather, uh, those come into play like I mentioned, kind of for evacuation plans or emergency maybe. routes, other things of that nature. I don't, I wouldn't see us, it, you know, in Minnesota, for example, I wouldn't see us designing for snowstorms and specifically widening things or making changes to our intersections because we get a snowstorm six to 12 times a year. I mean, that's, um, it is, I think, really for those emergency situations, not not your typical day. Okay. Uh, we are approaching 1 o'clock. Any last questions in the chat? Okay. Seeing none, thank you, everyone, and uh, we'll be back next week and hope to see you there.